Welcome to the first in this three video series about the oceans. Our learning targets for this video will be to discuss the chemical composition of seawater, to explain the ocean's layered temperature and salinity structure, to describe the major features of the continental margin and ocean floor, and to list the three types of seafloor sediments. We'll start off with seawater composition. In the diagram in the top left, you can see on the far left, the entirety of seawater. And of that entirety of seawater, we have a small portion here of the saline portion, the salt portion. So salinity is defined as the total amount of solid dissolved in water, or the ratio of the mass of the dissolved substances to the mass of the water sample. The average salinity is about 35 parts per thousand. We can see that in the map on the right side here, where we see from the blue being the lower salinity at about 33 parts per thousand, up to the red being the highest salinity at about 38 parts per thousand. So you'll notice the distribution of the higher salinities and the lower salinities. In the composition of seawater, sodium chloride is the most common of the salts. And ocean salts come from typically two places, the land, which inputs about 2.5 billion tons per year of salts into the ocean from the chemical weathering of surface rocks, and from the outgassing of Earth's interior. Let's turn now to looking at the variations in salinity. Salinity varies between about 33 and 38 parts per thousand. The surface processes that impact salinity are that there are high evaporation rates in the subtropics and that concentrates the salt. And we can see that in the diagram here where we see the blue line indicating salinity. And the center of this diagram is the equator. So the subtropical regions are these high areas of salinity both to the north and to the south latitudes. High precipitation rates in the equatorial regions, so that would be the dip in salinity here, as that dilutes salinity by adding fresh water via precipitation. And then melt water from ice and ice sheets also diluting salinity. So you can see in the high polar regions, so up here in the north and in the high latitudes in the south, both temperature and salinity decreasing. Salinity in polar regions also varies seasonally. So when ice forms in the fall and in the winter in the respective poles, that will increase the salinity in the water. And when ice melts, it will lower the salinity in the water. And we can see a general trend here from 1978 through to about 2015 from the NSIDC showing the Arctic sea ice extent in September of each year. So this would be at the end of the melting season. and You see a general decrease or decline in the sea ice coverage in the Arctic. Turning now to thinking about ocean density. So density and temperature conditions drive oceanic circulation and marine ecosystems. And we'd be talking about ocean circulation in the second video. There are two major features in terms of ocean density, and they are the thermocline, which is a rapid change in temperature with depth, and a pycnocline, which is a rapid change in density with depth. So in the top left diagram, we see three panels here. So we see the tropical region, and the blue line is winter, and the red line is summer, and we see increasing depth. So the surface of the ocean is up here at the top, Going down into the graph, increasing depth, you see this dramatic decrease in temperature in the tropics. So the thermocline would be right about here. And you see that dramatic decrease in both the summer and the winter with increasing depth. In the mid-latitudes, in the summer, you see somewhat of a thermocline, so a slight decrease in temperature with depth. But in the winter months, it's more stable. And in the polar regions, you notice that there is very little temperature change with depth. The water there is typically cold all year round. So now on the pycnocline, we'll look at this diagram to the right here. We see low latitudes and high latitudes. Let's start with the high latitudes. In the high latitudes, the pycnocline is absent. It is a high salinity value at all depths. 
In low latitudes, we see a very pronounced pycnocline with the surface waters being dramatically lower in density than the subsurface, than the deep waters, and the pycnocline coming into effect at about 800 to 1,000 meters of depth. All of that leads to oceanic layering. So we have three general layers of the ocean, and those layers are defined by different densities. In the shallow regions, this pink area at the top of this graph, we can see the shallow warm surface mixed, mixed zone. It's really only about 2% of the total ocean water, and it goes down to a depth of about 1,000 feet. The layer underneath that, slightly denser, is the transition zone, which makes up about 18% of the total ocean water. And the thermocline and the pycnocline reside in this transition zone. The great majority, or about 80% of the ocean's water, is found in the deep zone. And in this zone, ocean temperatures are typically around zero degrees Celsius. Moving on now to talk about the topography of ocean floors and to talk about active and passive margins. We'll start with this bottom diagram, and we notice here that the general topography is if you leave the continent walking down a gradual shelf, continental shelf, a steeper continental slope, a less steep continental rise, and then a broad, flat abyssal plain. Climbing up a mid-ocean ridge to the rift valley where the div divergent plate boundary is, finding some seamounts, volcanic structures on the abyssal plain, and possibly a trench indicating a subduction zone or convergent plate boundary. In the case of a passive continental margin, we're looking at a geologically inactive margin that's far from plate boundaries. And it's far from plate boundaries because that continental block is actually attached to oceanic crust. So it's one large plate. And those shelves, continental shelves, on a passive continental margin are typically heavily sediment covered. Contrast that with a convergent active continental margin. So we're up against a convergent plate boundary with a deep ocean trench here, lots of earthquake and volcanic activity, and an offshore subduction zone. Turning now to ocean floor sediments, three different categories. Origenous sediments, those are sediments transported directly from the land, things like gravel, sand, silt, and clay. They include deltas and turbidity deposits, and they're typically graded with those largest grains closest to the shoreline and progressively finer grains out towards sea. The biogenous sediments, to me the most interesting, a couple are pictured here, are typically microscopic organisms living in the sunlit near surface waters, and when they die, they rain down as white snow towards the ocean bottom. And these are calcareous and siliceous tests. So in the picture here, you can see the microscopic version of foraminifera and radiolaria. And finally, hydrogenous sediments. These are minerals that crystallize directly from the seawater. In this category, we have some limestones, things like manganese nodules shown here. So here's an intact manganese nodule, and here's one that is cut open so that you can see that concentric layering of manganese around that central object. And then also metal sulfides that are deposited in black and white smokers. Well, I think we're ready to take a check on our learning targets and head off to the mastery quiz. So our learning targets were to discuss the chemical composition of seawater, to explain the ocean's layered temperature and salinity structure, to describe the major features of the continental margin and ocean floor, and to list the types of seafloor sediments. Go ahead and take your mastery check quiz, and I'll see you in class.